Um, so I, I don't like this operator. Now recently I was reviewing some code, this is a true story, and I saw this, plus plus x plus plus x. And you wonder, okay, nice. <laughs> what's the story here? <laughs> I'm guessing someone had written plus plus x, which is in fact the right way to write it. Um, and then someone else observed that there was an off by one error, uh, so they came in and did it again. You know, if the original guy had written x plus equal one, then the second guy would have changed it to a two, and it would have been much cleaner. You know, and so that raises a question, why do we need a completely different syntactic form for adding one to something? Why should one be different than all of the other values we'd ever add? This is an exceptional piece of syntax that I just don't see um, the use for. Um, so you know, for all these reasons, I just say, it's not worth it. I, I just don't see the sense of it. I think the code is cleaner and easier to understand if we just not use it. Um, so for no cost, by adopting a more rigorous style, many classes of errors can be automatically avoided. And I think, you know, as a general policy, that's a good trade-off. Here's another one. This is another one that's Thompson's fault. Um, when BCPL actually got this right, um, Thompson changed it. Um, the thing that BCPL got right was the uh, braces around the condition were optional. I'm sorry, the, the parents around the condition were optional, but the braces were required. Thompson, I think, maybe still had some nice memories of Fortran and decided, no, the parentheses should be required and the braces should be optional which was wrong, that was a mistake, and that mistake has been copied in virtually every language since then. The reason it's a mistake was you, you've got code like this, which looks like it means what the red statement does, but actually means what the green statement is. Um, and this is well documented as being a hazardous construction. And it's really bad in agile code, code which is developed incrementally that many people are going to be changing over time because it invites this kind of accidental um, structure where you've got um, uh, an expression which looks like it's going to be conditional and it's not. Um, so my advice is always put the curly braces in every time. E even if you've got a case where they don't appear to be necessary, put the curly braces in. They'll make your program more resilient and other people can come in and understand your program and make it even better, reducing the likelihood that they're gonna break it in the process. Spent a lot of time, uh, many years in fact, trying to improve the professional standing of this silly language. Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of people, I've written a lot, I've visited lots of universities, I go to CS departments and try to convince them, you should be looking at the web. The web is important, it turns out. And you should be teaching people about how the web works. And you should be uh, doing research about this language because we got problems and we need you to help us figure out how to make it better. Um, and one of the things that I find is working against me in trying to raise the professional level of this language um, are the bad stylists, the people who for one reason or another seem to be intentionally writing bad code um, and I don't know what their motivation is, but I, I can classify them into four groups. Uh, first, they're the un, un, undereducated, people who really have no training in programming. Um, you don't find many of these in the communities of other languages, but you find a lot of them in JavaScript. And that's because JavaScript has so much expressive power, you can be completely ignorant about what you're doing and still get some work done. <laughs> There are not many other languages that can make that boast, if you would call it a boast. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of the features that make the language that easy also make it hard to use it professionally. Um, those are some of the things that invite our traps. Um, we see this especially in the jQuery community. There are a lot of people slinging jQuery stuff around who know nothing about the underlying language that it's actually written in. And so a lot of bad stuff comes out there. Um, I see a lot of people coming from other languages, you know, coming from uh, C++ or Java or, or others, coming to JavaScript under duress, you know, because they can't get jobs doing those languages anymore. Um, so, you know, the future is in JavaScript, damn it, okay, I'll write it, uh, but I'm not going to learn it. 
Um, <laughs> that was me. When I started writing JavaScript, I refused to learn it. it. It looked like I already knew it. It looked so familiar. I thought, yeah, that's it. Um, and one day in frustration, I finally read the standard and go, wow, this is not what I expected at all. Um, and by reading the standard, I discovered that it had lambdas in it. It has good parts, wow. And then I started telling people, you know there are good parts in JavaScript? No way. <laughs> no way. There can't possibly be good parts in that language. Um, so you see people coming to JavaScript trying to write in other languages. And JavaScript, again, has so much expressive power that you can actually go some distance doing that. Um, so I still see a lot of people trying to write in a classical style, uh, bringing all the baggage that comes with that, um, not understanding that JavaScript, because it's prototypal, you can just throw that stuff away and just write your program, and you don't have to do taxonomy anymore. And all the things that go wrong as a result of not fully understanding the domain that you're trying to classify. That it's just so much better. Um, and, and you see that in other languages too. You know, in the early on, and maybe it still goes on, there were a lot of people writing C++ as though it was C, a lot of people writing in Java as though it was C++ and so on, but it seems to be worse in JavaScript. Then there are the thrill seekers who are writing code which is intentionally dangerous um, just because they want to show their rad skills that, you know, I can leave the semicolons out, I know exactly where they go. Man, I, I, you, know. <laughs> you know, they're like the, the guys who get kicked in the nards on the YouTube videos. They go, yeah, I'm doing it, I'm, yeah. Um, and then there, finally there are the exhibitionists. So these are maybe the smartest of these guys. They will study the language. They'll go through the specification. They'll go through the implementations. Um, they will exhaustively check out the edge case. And the, the edge cases in JavaScript are vast and gnarly. And they'll, they'll work it all out and figure out, OK, what's the weirdest feature of this language I can find? Wow, that's really unexpected. How can I use that? <laughs> You know, I, you know, did you know that you can use um, an exclamation point as a semicolon? Y you can. <laughs> it's insanely stupid, but you can. And, and so they'll do it. Um, they, they'll show off. They will write code which is ridiculous looking um, because they can show their skills. Um, I don't recommend any of these practices. Um, that, that, is I, in all of these cases, I think some bad trade-offs are going on. And you hear these guys, when you talk to them, they say, I'm do that was intentional. I'm doing that on purpose. You know, I know what I'm doing. And I say, no, if you knew what you were doing, you would not be doing that. <laughs> so programming is the most complicated thing that humans do. Computer programs must be perfect, and we are far from perfect. Um, I consider myself a deeply flawed human being. And so I need this discipline in order to write stuff which is this complicated um, that needs to approach perfection far beyond what I'm capable of. So designing a programming style demands discipline. It's not selecting features because they are liked or pretty or familiar or radical. Um, it's because they can help reduce your error rate. And I don't think there's anything else that we can do that can make us more effective as programmers. Um, the alternative is the abyss. You know what I'm talking about. We've all been there. You know, you've got this bug, and you just go down into this place where it's cold, and it's dark, and there's despair, and it is soul-crushing. Um, Nietzsche said, when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. <laughs> and it's awful. Um, but we are optimists, and because uh, we couldn't do this job if we weren't optimists. So when we go down into the abyss, we have this irrational confidence that we're going to figure it out and we're going to come back up. And we do. And when we come back up, there's this great sense of relief and joy. You know, I did it. I'm out of there. and go back on. Um, I used to think that programming was this amazing thing. I had this sense that learning programming gave me a whole new way of organizing my understanding of everything. And I thought, everybody should learn to do this. Um, 
But then I'd talk to other programmers and go, no, I, I don't think this is really giving us a leg up on, on truth or anything else. And we seem to be as capable of getting things wrong as anybody else. Um, also, I, um, there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong with all of us, which is the thing which allows us to go into the abyss and come back. Um, normal people, when they go down into the abyss, they say, OK, I'm changing majors. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with people. I can't do this. This is, this is awful. Um, so I, I think all people are potentially capable of, of programming, but very few people are capable of debugging uh, because you need this special defect. You know, um, it's sort of like childbirth. You know, after the end of all that pain, it's like, ah, I feel good, forget about that. Let's have another one. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and so because we black that out, we're not aware of how much time we spend there. And, and when we are in, in the abyss, we are completely unproductive. We're not getting anything done. We're just there and for the duration until we can get it done. So if we want to become more efficient, um, you need to improve on the things that, you, that take the most time. And we are unaware of how much time we're spending in the abyss. Um, so anything we can do to reduce the amount of time we spend there is going to make us much more productive. Vastly more productive than figuring out how to shave a few keystrokes off, because that turns out to be in the noise. That's irrelevant. Staying out of the abyss, that's a huge win. So the JS Lint style was driven by the need to automatically detect defects. Uh, forms that can hide defects are considered defective. So um, early on, I spent a lot of time on comp.lang.javascript. And th there was a constant stream of people saying, my program doesn't work, and someone would tell me what's wrong. So I take their program, and I put it into JSLint, and sometimes it would go, yep, yeah, there's a problem, and I'd, I'd post it back. And sometimes it couldn't find the problem. And then I go, wow, you know, how can I figure this out? Um, and sometimes it's hard, because JSLint has to work statically. Um, and sometimes they're using forms where it's difficult to tell if the form is being used correctly or not. And eventually, I had the epiphany that, well, if I just, if they're using one of those ambiguous forms, just say, well, first, stop doing that. And then I can tell you a lot more about what's going on in your program. Um, so that, that's my advice now. Um, so I did not understand that when I started with JSLint. It's not like I had some idea of what the perfect style was going to be and tried to impose it on a program. It was the other way. The program taught me what style is. Turns out JSLint is a lot smarter about JavaScript than I am. Um, so the approach I, I finally came to accept was language subsetting. Because every language has bad parts, and it turns out the bad parts are generally unnecessary, you can simply stop using them. Um, the designer of a language uh, will necessarily overreach. They'll borrow some features from existing languages, and they'll add a few new ideas of their own. And some of those ideas turn out to be really good and, and push the state of the art, and some of them turn out to be wrong. And it's not clear at design time which of those it's going to be. And if the language turns out to be popular, like uh, JavaScript, which is the most popular language in the world now, you can't take it back. Now, if your language is a failure, then you've got lots of uh, liberty to, to change it. But if it gets out there and people start using it, you can't undo those mistakes. Because the problem with those bad parts isn't that they're useless. Uh, it's that they're dangerous. You know, asking if a feature is useful is way too low a bar. You know, asking, can we use it reliably? You know, is it literate? You know, does it make sense? Can we write correct programs with it? That's what we should be trying to achieve. You, know, you can use a, a bent, rusty nail as a tool. It has uses. But that probably shouldn't be in your toolbox. You know, it's, it's been said that a madman, uh, only a madman would use all of C++. It's also been said only a madman would use C++, but that's for another night. <laughs> you know, so the designer of the language does not have the power to remove features, but you do. You can decide which of those features make sense, are going to make you a more effective programmer, are going to keep you out of the abyss, and just use those. Um, so there will be bugs. I'm not promising by having a, a more rigorous style that you're going to avoid bugs. There will always be bugs. 
what I am promising is that you can shave the odds in your favor. You can spend less time in the abyss, and you can do that for no cost. So that's the end. Good style is good for your gut. Don't forget your semicolons. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>